In a gripping tale of crime and suspense, the trials of Gabriel Fernandez unravels the harrowing events that unfolded in May 2013. At the center of this true story lies Gabriel Fernandez, an innocent eight-year-old boy subjected to unspeakable abuse and torture by his mother and her boyfriend. A series on Netflix portrays this abuse through interviews and reports. The documentary covers all the shocking events and adds curiosity about why this abuse happened. In today's video, we will discover the shocking truth behind this heart-wrenching story. On May 24, 2013, a heartbreaking tragedy unfolded in Palmdale, California. Gabriel Fernandez, a sweet eight-year-old boy, lost his life due to the relentless abuse and torture inflicted upon him by his mother, Pearl Fernandez, and her boyfriend, Isoro Aguirre. Let's take a look at the victim first. Gabriel was born on February 20, 2005, to Arnold Contreras and Pearl Fernandez. But soon after his birth, he was placed in the care of his great uncle, Michael Lemos Carranza, and his partner, David Martinez. They lovingly raised Gabriel for four years until he was moved to live with his grandparents in 2009. This decision was made due to his grandfather's disapproval of Carranza and Martinez's same-sex relationship. Sadly, in 2012, Gabriel's mother, Pearl Fernandez, and her boyfriend, Isauro Aguirre, regained custody of him, despite concerns expressed by the family regarding Gabriel's well-being. But the sad and shocking thing is that they both appear to be monsters to this innocent soul. Before diving into what happened to him, let's look at the perpetrators. Did you know that Pearl Fernandez, one of the central figures in the tragic story of Gabriel Fernandez, had a troubled childhood? Born on August 29, 1983, she faced a difficult upbringing with her father frequently in and out of jail and her mother allegedly abusive. At a young age, Pearl started using drugs and alcohol, eventually dropping out of school. She claimed to have experienced traumatic events, including sexual assault, profoundly impacting her mental health. Despite abandoning Gabriel shortly after his birth, Pearl regained custody in 2012. However, she had a history of abusive relationships and faced pending charges for threatening her ex-partner. Diagnosed with various mental health issues, Pearl struggled with controlling her emotions and behavior. On the other hand, Isoro Aguirre, also known as Tony Aguirre, was described by colleagues as a kind and caring person. He worked as a caregiver and driver at a retirement home, earning a reputation for his patience and helpfulness. Aguirre met Pearl Fernandez, and together they took custody of Gabriel. Are you wondering what happened that day? And what did those people do with him? Let us take a look. Gabriel, just eight years old, endured unimaginable abuse and torture during his eight-month stay with them. The extent of his suffering was horrifying, including regular beatings resulting in broken bones, being forced to consume vile substances like cat litter, feces and vomit, and enduring burns from cigarettes and BB gunshots. He was even subjected to pepper spray, made to wear women's clothing, and confined in a small cupboard while bound and gagged. The abuse extended to his siblings, but Gabriel bore the brunt of it. It was his parent who took his life. The motivation behind the relentless abuse was particularly disturbing. Aguirre believed Gabriel was gay and targeted him for that reason. In a shocking turn of events, on May 22, 2013, Pearl Fernandez called 911 to report that Gabriel was not breathing. When responders arrived, they discovered Gabriel naked on the ground, covered in injuries. Aguirre callously referred to Gabriel as gay when explaining the situation. Paramedics rushed Gabriel to the hospital, but it was too late. He was declared brain dead and tragically passed away on May 24, 2013 at 8. The official autopsy revealed that Gabriel's cause of death was blunt force trauma, neglect and malnutrition. In May 2013, Pearl Fernandez and Isoro Aguirre were arrested, initially on charges of child endangerment and attempted murder. However, after Gabriel's tragic death, both Fernandez and Aguirre were charged with first-degree murder, including the charge of torture. Prosecutors sought the death penalty for their crimes. Pearl Fernandez pleaded guilty on February 15, 2018, to avoid the death penalty. As part of a plea deal, she received a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The shocking part? During her court appearance, she expressed remorse, saying she was sorry for what happened and wished Gabriel was still alive. 
she acknowledged her poor choices and expressed love for her other children, apologizing to them as well. But she has done what is not good, but what the actual monster does. Gabriel's teacher, Jennifer Garcia, became concerned when he asked her if it was customary to bleed after being hit with a belt buckle. Garcia immediately called social services and social worker Stephanie Rodriguez was assigned to the case. On another occasion, Gabriel came to class with missing chunks of hair and a lump on his lip. When questioned by Garcia, Gabriel revealed that his mother had punched him in the mouth. Garcia promptly informed Rodriguez about these signs of abuse. Gabriel also reported to his teacher that his mother had shot him in the face with a BB gun. Once again, Garcia notified social services about this alarming incident. Despite these repeated reports, there was a lack of effective action. Gabriel missed 13 days of school, and when he returned, his condition worsened. Garcia attempted to contact Rodriguez, but her calls were never returned. This is shocking to know that, at some time, he holds the poster written M.O.M. with a smile with broken teeth. The teeth were broken by his mother and his mother's boyfriend with the bat. And this was not the first time he was beaten. School teachers and even the class fellow also noticed this. Gabriel's great aunt, Elizabeth Carranza, and her husband contacted social services multiple times and spoke to sheriffs to express their concerns for Gabriel's well-being. Additionally, a security guard named Arturo Miranda Martinez noticed the extensive injuries on Gabriel's body and called 911, risking his job to report the abuse to the sheriffs. A security guard noticed signs of abuse and reported it. He spoke to a woman named Maricela Corona, who worked in the domestic violence unit and had seen the abused child Gabriel before. However, when Pearl went to the Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS office, one of the workers there, Maricela, made fun of Gabriel's hair, which had been pulled out and had scabs on his head. Maricela should have recognized the signs of abuse, but instead mocked the boy. Maricela's supervisors instructed her not to get involved or file a report because it was late on a Friday and they didn't want to pay overtime. However, Maricela still gave Gabriel's home information to the security guard, Martinez, who wanted to file a complaint. This was a violation of privacy rules, HIPAA. Martinez called 911, but was scolded for not considering it an emergency and told to contact the sheriff. The sheriffs had been informed earlier about Gabriel's situation including his suicide notes and being beaten by other children, but they did nothing to help. It's unclear if Martinez, the security guard, lost his job after reporting the abuse, but he did inform his superiors about his intention to do so. It is truly disheartening to learn that despite the numerous reports and complaints, the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services response was insufficient. Two social workers, Stephanie Rodriguez and Patricia Clement, and their supervisors, Kevin Baum and Gregory Merritt, were ultimately fired and charged with child abuse and falsifying public records. These charges carried significant consequences, including the possibility of up to 11 years in prison. However, these charges were later dismissed by California's Second District Court of Appeal due to a lack of probable cause. Although prosecutors attempted to pursue a rehearing, they eventually decided to drop the charges in January 2020. In addition to the social workers, it is worth noting that nine sheriff's deputies were internally disciplined for their failure to investigate the abuse allegations properly. The governmental response to Gabriel Fernandez's case sparked widespread controversy and raised important questions about the effectiveness of child protection services. It highlighted the need for significant improvements in identifying and responding to child abuse cases ensuring that the welfare and safety of vulnerable children are given the highest priority. What are your thoughts on this? What measures are being attempted to address and prevent such abuse or combat this crime? Let us know in the comments below. Let's engage in a discussion and unravel this enigma together. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more crime content and intriguing mystery stories.